Judaism 101 this morning, uh, another part of Jewish values and ethics, and also my larger talk for this morning. So here I have from the Art Scroll translation, which I will be adapting. This is uh, the divine speaking through Malachi. Know that I have sent this commandment to you, to the people of Israel, so that my covenant would be with Levi, the tribe of Levi, says Adonai, master of legions. My covenant of life and peace was with him. I gave them to him for the sake of the awe with which he held me in awe, for he shuddered before my name. The teaching of truth was in his mouth, and no injustice was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and fairness, and he turned many away from sin. For the lips of the Kohen should safeguard knowledge, and they should seek teaching from his mouth. For he is an agent of Adonai, the master of legions. And the our art scroll is using the word agent to translate the word malach, meaning, of course, a messenger, someone on a divine mission, an angel. What does this have to do with uh, Jewish values and ethics? Sometimes when we think about Jewish values and ethics, we go to a text like this and notice there's something both uh, very much tied to the crisis exilic Judaism, as, as the uh, Judeans were trying to reestablish their, uh, their nation, but also an understanding of what they stood for. So look at some of the things here. He says, um, a covenant of life and peace. What they mean by a covenant of life, of course, is that there's a proper way to live. And the proper way to live was tied both up into the ritual dimension. Uh, the ritual of the dimension seems to be tied to having an intense connection with the divine, uh, and, uh, which is behind, for example, the observance of the Sabbath, prayer, uh, etc. So try to imagine, at least from an Israelite, and I think from a Jewish perspective, uh, I'll say authentically religious Jewish perspective, not a value that all, all Jews hold, but some connection with the spiritual life, some connection with the divine, if that's in your vocabulary, produces something that we'll call life in its most authentic sense. As we just go discuss over the high holidays, a life of, of authenticity and depth. Because if one does not have some kind of connection with deep truth, to believe that we are seeking for something called the truth, the problem is then, of course, uh, we are unmoored in our lives. We are living in a, in a world that is n not navigable. There is no place to go. Our lives are meaningless. We don't stand for anything except in some very basic way our physical existence and a life of pleasure, which is something I want to talk about in uh, just a moment. I mean, what does it mean to be a human being? Does it mean a hedonistic search to create pleasure in our lives? Or do we stand for deeper things? So part of what it means when he says the truth was in his mouth, the truth is, according to the first section here, is some deep connection with what I'm going to call spiritual reality. It's debatable what that is. But the first thing, remember, is to emphasize here, there was actually something called metaphysical spiritual reality. Because if there were not, then why seek it? So first we have to assume there is a proper way to live, rooted in the life of spirit, and therefore it is worth seeking out. If it doesn't exist, it's not worth seeking out. And I think we're just left to some other way to govern our lives, which I, I don't think is tenable for any person of depth who's seeking meaning. Now remember, shalom here, uh, shalom certainly means peace between people and between nations, but the word shalom, as you know, is from the Hebrew word for wholeness. And Adam shalem is a whole human being. So certainly human wholeness is connected to our living in wholeness with each other, meaning not violating each other, not transgressing each other, etc. Shalom is not simply lack of violence, lack of animosity, lack of hostility. There's a deep inner sense of, uh, of well-being. Then he says, the teaching of truth was in his mouth, and no injustice was found in his lips. That's another key word that we'll call an authentic Jewish value, is the value of justice. Now, it's another one of those terms that if you don't think there's a metaphysical value of justice, why seek it? Meaning, as um, uh, I'll be re referencing uh, here and there Plato's Republic this morning, but he, uh, the idea that justice is simply a tool used by the powerful to exert their will on those with less power. It's just a made-up word. Now you find this in the work of uh, David Hume. You find this in some modern thinkers. Well, several thinkers who say that metaphysical reality, justice, truth, etc., are just made up. They're simply human conventions. They don't re refer to anything well, uh, real, and they're just ways that people uh, uh, manipulate each other. I really detest that point of view, 
But so many people believe it almost reflectively. Um, as I've shared, I've taught in Jewish institutions where I'll talk about truth, justice, and peace. They'll say, well, aren't those just human conventions? Don't they just reflect the mores of society? They're not real. I object to this point of view because, as you know, I believe that this point of view is one of the things that has allowed the spiritual, intellectual, and moral de degradation in our college campuses. I think there's a direct line between relativism, truth, and moral relativism that leaves us immune from bad ideas so that then people will, will take on a bad idea because they have no a good idea to begin with. They have nothing by which they can assess a bad idea. And that's, I'm going to say, that's the fault of we who have, number one, I don't think raised our children, many people, with a sense of the authenticity of morals and truth. Uh, many parents say, well, it's all mores of society. It's, it's a safe thing to say. You don't sound absolutist. You don't sound bossy. It sounds very tolerant. But then our children are not prepared to go into a world where there are absolutists and who believe something absolutely evil, which is why you will hear me talking for the rest of my life about the importance of some sense of the metaphysical truth, uh, the metaphysical power of truth and, uh, and justice. The uh, truth of the Kohen the person who officiated before God, I'm going to say that is each of us, because we are a mamlechet kohenim and a goy kadosh. We are a, a, a sovereign nation of priests and a holy people. So what does it mean to be part of a mamlechet kohenim, where each one of us is a kohen, right? We're not kohen in the sense, the sense that we officiate in the holy temple. We're not kohen that we call, get called up for the first aliyah at a traditional synagogue. A kohen is someone who safeguards knowledge, and they seek, and people ought to seek the teaching from the mouth of the Kohen because the whole Kohen is a malach of God, is someone on a godly mission. So try to imagine that each of us has a responsibility to be the Kohen who brings a, piece of, a message of truth and fairness and justice and peace, well and deeply considered, that we can explain it well, that we can make a case for it. So from this I'm taking as a Jewish value, an absolute obligation to figure out what is true, what is right, what is just, and what leads to peace, and turn others away from paths that do not lead to truth, justice, and peace. Whatever one thinks a Jewish value is, I want to stand by the values that I'm extracting from the end of the book of uh, Malachi, that each one of us is a malach, in certain sense, each one of us is an angel in the literal etymological sense that we are invested with a divine spirit and we are on a mission, a mission from the divine to bring truth and justice and righteousness and peace into the world. So anybody who wants to call themselves a Jew, not by affiliation, not by ethnicity, but something as a deeper calling... I think interpreting the last few lines of the book of uh, Malachi is a, is a really wonderful place to start. That is our vocation. That is our calling. As I segue into my talk this morning, uh, there are two things, of course, on our minds. One is, as complex as things are in Israel, I think, uh, you know, there's what you might call one side, another side, and a middle side. So I want to outline what I stand for. I want to be very transparent. I am on the side of compassion for all human beings. Let me make that very clear. I have, uh, and, and I think I'm going to speak for the vast majority of Israelis and certainly the vast majority of Jews. I have no ill will toward Palestinians. I have no ill will toward Arabs. Uh, I have ill will toward bad ideas. I have ill will toward murderers and evil people, but not any group of people. I think I, and I'm not Israeli, though my wife is Israeli and my, three of my four children are Israeli, uh, we only wish the best for Palestinians. We wish for them safe and pre peace and prosperity and a just society, practice their religion in the way they want, as long as they don't infringe on the rights of other people. I have a very, what I call, modern, liberal, political understanding of the state and religion. The primacy of human dignity and human rights is firm, and whatever religion you teach, it should not interfere with the primacy of human rights and dignity. Now, so now we're at the, at the edge of this idea, uh, when there's an enemy who wants to destroy a, a nation, as Hamas and Iran and others want to destroy the state of Israel, now we're put into a difficult position, because now we're brought into a war. And one thing I realized during this time is 
People either pretend they don't know what war is, but they actually know what war is, or they actually don't know what war is. And when you're fighting a war, what I'm going to call an absolute war against an absolute evil, which means it's a struggle for existence about, against an enemy. When you look at the, at the atrocities of October 7th, Hamas has said, we'll do this a thousand times. We'll do this a million times. We're never going to stop. It's a permanent state of war. They've said this. And they've also said, we're starting with the Saturday people, then we're coming with the Sunday people. The goal of this radical form of Islam is world domination and the extermination of anyone who doesn't agree with them. Many people have compared uh, Hamas to ISIS. It's an apt definition. And remember, the amount of Muslims, the number of Muslims who were massacred by ISIS. Uh, not Israel, by the way. ISIS is the greatest cause of massacres and death in the modern world, especially Shiites. When ISIS came out of Syria into Iraq, they massacred uh, hundreds and thousands of Shiites. Most people don't know that the Iraq War, meaning substance to the American invasion and occupation, the Iraq War was a war against radical Sunnis who declared genocide against Shias. You may not believe this because you may not have heard it. The United States stayed there to protect the Shias from the Sunnis. You might not know that that was what the Iraq War was about, why we stayed so long. Go ahead and look it up. A Shia cleric in Iraq said, accept the American occupation. They're not here forever. They're trying to set up a democracy. So there was an official Shia understanding that we're not at war with America. They were at war with Saddam Hussein, not with us. The Sunni went to war to exterminate Shia. And that Sunni desire to exterminate the Shia was one of the motivating forces of the creation of ISIS. So... There's a lot going on behind the scenes that we don't know because I think we get mesmerized by certain kinds of things, but not the deeper level of Sunni-Shia hatred that has permeated the uh, Islamic world and certainly ISIS' intention to commit genocide against anyone not in the radical Sunni world, including all Shia, including all Christians, as you know, including all Jews. This is the kind of war we're in. So now the question is, although I am governed by compassion, the question is, what does it mean to fight a war against such an intractable enemy? Now, many people say, as you've heard, we need a ceasefire because civilians are suffering. The response is, civilians are suffering because Hamas has put them in the way. So now the question is, if others are using human beings as a human shield so that they continue their intractable permanent war against the uh, state of Israel, what does one do? There are some who say, and I think they believe this, it doesn't matter. Civilians are getting hurt, and therefore there has to be a ceasefire. I look at the New York Times this morning. That is their point of view. They go in with a photographic essay. Children are suffering. Therefore, there has to be a ceasefire. Therefore, Hamas can rebuild, and therefore there will be another October 7th. It's just like that. So I don't, I quite, I don't quite understand the reporting of the New York Times on this issue because either they're incredibly naive, incredibly short-sighted, or they really don't care that Hamas intends genocide against the state of Israel. I, I don't understand it. What I authentically think is just very puerile reporting. It's very childish reporting. That you have, a, you have, you have a, an image of a child suffering in, uh, in Gaza because of the Israeli war on Gaza, and that's the end of thinking. Uh, if you thought further... I could ask that person, what would you do to defeat Hamas? And they said, I would do anything but hurt innocent people. Well, then there's no war. Then Hamas wins. And then October 7th will happen again. Maybe not the way that it did. It will go back to rockets, incessant random rockets, bus bombings, and so forth. So just to give you a summary of what I think is happening, the war, there are those who say Israel has no right to exist, Palestine free from the river to the sea, genocide against the Jews. This is very out with it. You have a group that says Israel does have a right to exist, Warfare must not include the harm of innocents. They're a little bit late to the game. They could have said that a long time ago against Hamas. No, people don't. And there are those who say, this is like World War II. The Germans didn't call out for a ceasefire and say, you're hurting our civilians. Stop the invasion. Hitler stays in power. Uh, I saw a satire that showed a clip of World War II of the Allies defeating Germany. Winston Churchill, the war criminal, because he wasn't accepting the Nazi call for a ceasefire because civilians were getting hurt, took an old reel and just put different subtitles on it. 
Franklin Roosevelt is the war criminal, the allies of the war criminals, because the Nazis, they just want a ceasefire. You know my politics, I just think it's, it's ridiculous and doesn't understand the idea of evil. But So wherever you are, if you're here to think that there should be genocide against the state of Israel, you're probably not here today. There's a strong middle that says, feels so sorry that we just say, it just has to stop. Civilians so are getting hurt. I understand. It's a moral perspective. I don't think tenable in the long run. And there are those who say, we really feel bad for the civilians, but not so bad that Hamas gets to rebuild and just keep this permanent state of war. So that's my political commentary for this morning, because I know it's on everybody's mind, so I want to go into my deeper theme. My deeper theme uh, last night, uh, and it's coincidentally part of our Torah portion, is the theme of resentment and envy. Uh, we see it in our Parsha with the story of Jacob and Esau. Uh, one of my interpretations, why Isaac does not interfere with the brothers, where Jacob is clearly the chosen one by God, and Esau, even though he was the firstborn, is not chosen by God to leave the people. And Isaac has this, this concern. Now, this is, a, this is, of course, my interpretation, that Esau's sense of self must not be damaged. So I'm going to call this a parental identification with the child who might be hurt of the family dynamic. I've seen this many times, by the way. And therefore, they go to the other side, which is to do an injustice to protect the, as it were, more, more emotionally fragile child. I mean, we're going to call this Esau here. And again, there's a lot of family systems uh, psychology here. Rebecca knows that God has chosen Jacob. Isaac knows it at least implicitly. Jacob knows it. No one's told Esau, but again, he implicitly knows it. He implicitly knows he does not, he's not meeting the standard of what the, the soon-to-be people of Israel stands for. Isaac wants to protect Esau. Of course, Rebekah has to act on what she knows. She has to act on the knowledge that she has, that God has, that Jacob has, and possibly Isaac has. And of course, Esau is deeply wounded. Once he finds out the truth, even though you're the firstborn, you're not chosen by God, your birth order makes no difference here. There's something greater at stake than the custom of firstborn, and there's something greater at stake than your feelings. There's something greater at stake. Of course, Esau is deeply wounded, and he says, I will kill my brother Jacob. I will kill my brother Jacob, it says in this Torah portion. Now, I want us to think about that. Try to imagine Esau said, yeah, you know, I know I'm really not fit for this job. There's some quality here that I know I don't have. My brother Jacob has. I can't quite name it. It's very clear. I'll defer to my brother. I'll defer to God. I'll defer to my mother. I'll defer to my father. I'm going to find something else to do with my life. We would call that maturity. We would call that working through. But Esau is in that fixed position. By the way, there are many people in that fixed position because you made me feel bad, really bad about myself, you activated my shame wound, I must murder you. Now, not with any hope in my mind as I read the story that the Torah seems to imply that, that Esau will then get the blessing if he just murders his brother like Cain and Abel. And by the way, this is just a recapitulation of the Cain and Abel story. Is because uh, Jacob, by accepting the blessing, has simply pointed out to Esau that he is, in some way, deficient enough not to receive the blessing. Now, remember, deficiency is very subjective. Esau could say, it's not, I'm really not made for that. That's not who I am. I'm just something else with my life. There's evidence in the text that Esau exactly felt that. But I want to stay with this point of the great damage that happens to a human being when their sense of self and by the way, all sense of self is in some ways mortgage to the outside world. Sense of dignity and esteem, no matter how much we have from the inside, some great part of it comes from the outside. Now, it's not predictable what? One person might be a musician, one person might be author, uh, one person might be you know, a warrior, one person wa might want to make money, one person might want to excel at you know, being a physician or a psychologist. Uh, so we all choose different things uh, at which we want to excel. There's a type of person, Socrates talks about this in the Republic, there's a type of person whose identity is invested in this idea called pride. I don't mean in any negative sense. Some people look for external validation, and if they don't get it, they become furious, hurt, and ashamed. 
all of us ex ex seek external validation, but not all of us, if we don't get it, want to kill somebody. But there's a type of person that if they don't get external validation, they become filled with rage. So I don't mean pride in a neg negative sense. I'll just say the inherent human seeking of dignity and esteem. Uh, and dignity and esteem both comes from within with other people. So I'm reading the book uh, by Francis uh, Fukuyama. The title of the book is Identity. And he gives, uh, very eloquently, the deeper idea of identity politics. So remember, Aesop is an issue of identity. Aesop is, who am I? I'm the firstborn. I deserve the blessing. Not, who am I? I'm part of a, of a tragedy where the accident of being firstborn does not make one qualified for the office. It's just a tragedy. You know, and oftentimes when I hear of family struggles, I, I say, I would just call this a tragedy. People's passions and wills and desires conflict, and you know, there's the law of the excluded middle. Not everybody gets their way to the degree that they want. Ascribe it to human chance, let's move on with our lives. Other people can't, some people can't do that. This is not a tragedy. This is unfairness, and I'll stay angry the rest of my life. Because if they don't stay angry the rest of their life, they've lost some sense of their identity, meaning what they deserve, not the maturity to move forward. Okay, so you see this identity, remember, is the striving for part of identity, is having an inner identity. And again, I think many people think of ourselves as worthy of dignity, worthy of esteem, worthy of love, worthy of getting our needs met. There's the outside world that may have an opposite message. So identity is rooted in at least two things, my inner identity and how the world sees me, and my inability not to change how the world sees me. So therefore, I better redefine how I see myself, or I'll be at war with the world for the rest of my life, which can mean a war with the family, a war with the sibling, a war with somebody, unless one goes to what I call a maturation process, which is acceptance of who you are, what your envelope is, and moving on with your life, and trying to be an agent of love and goodness and justice to other people and not be in a fixed position of resentment and envy because your identity was not affirmed by the outside world. I know it's a mouthful, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to say it in, all, in one uh, complex sentence. So what Fukuyama points out is when you look at modern political systems, and I, I don't want to overstate the case, but the more I think about this book, it really is in many ways a key to understanding much of the modern world. And I, I, I'll, we'll, we'll start with... Uh, with Marx. You see, for Marx to divide the world into owners, the ruling class, the oppressors, and the oppressed, he's implicit saying there's something really wrong, that the oppressors are robbing not, not just the oppressed of, you might say, of the product of their labor. I mean, we give the idea of the chair. Someone hires me in their shop, uh, their carpenter shop, and I'm given the job of polishing the chair and somebody else cuts the chair, and someone else nails the chair together, and then we have a chair, and then the carpenter sells the chair on the market. He pays us, and what's left over is called capital, which is the profit incentive. Why else would we have a chair business? If I had enough self-esteem to say, look, I'm not an owner, I'm not a marketer, I don't know how to run a business, but I really know how to polish chairs. And you pay me a satisfactory wage, and I will polish all the chairs you want, or I'll quit and find another job. At some level, I'll call that maturity. Or I could say, that person is robbing me of my labor because he sold the chair for this amount of money, the wood cost him this much, he paid us this much, and that part in the middle does not belong to him, it belongs to us. Now, for me, that is ridiculous beyond imagination because it does not respect the productive value of the owner, the entrepreneur, the person who took the risk, the person who markets, who sets up the shop, tries to get customers, it's as if, from Marx's perspective, that's not actually work, because it's not material work. It's not the work of the hand. Uh, it's intellectual labor. So Marx st starts out with this utterly fallacious idea that work is material. Work is done with the hand, and then, therefore, the intellectual value, let's say, of the business owner has no worth, and therefore, it is actually thievery from the worker. Now, nobody actually lives that way. Nobody lives that way. But it's an idea, and notice what the idea does. It inspires resentment of people who work. Now, not all people, because some people say, hey, I don't want to be an owner. I don't want to market. I don't want to invest all my money in a business that might fail. I don't want to do any of that. I just want a job. You know, I'll work nine to five, 
and I'll take my pay home, and I'll have a barbecue on Saturday. I'll go to church on Sunday. That's my life. Another person says, there's thievery. They're stealing from me, which, of course, fuels resentment. So remember, Marxism is inherently a politics of resentment. It's a fallacious economic idea, but its main value is it justifies resentment among a certain group of people. And remember, even those who are not, whose character is not built on resentment become resentful because they're told there's a thievery going on. So when you actually look at this idea that there's an oppressor, there's the oppressed, there's an inherent indignifying, which creates a resentment, and therefore the cure, as it were, the fix is to overthrow the ownership class, the ruling class, and have everything owned by, as it were, the workers. Now, as a state system, it has never worked once in history. That ought to tell us something. Because even in so-called the worker state, there's some elite that rises to the top. And if you notice in the history of any communist socialist country, I'm here talking about the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republic, People's Republic of China, etc. The first thing they do is outlaw trade unions. They outlaw the free press. They outlaw elections. Because the workers actually don't matter. It's just another way to create an elite, but with a fraudulent idea. As you can tell, I'm very, very suspect of anybody who says, I'm for the worker, but outlaws elections, outlaws trained unions, fix the wages, and the wealth just, just percolates up. By the way, people have pointed out, what about the kibbutz in Israel? Isn't that socialist? Okay, now I want, I want you to see the great fallacy there. It's cooperative. So I lived on a kibbutz, and there's all kinds of crops and goods, and we had almonds, and we had apples, and oranges, and a wood shop, and a metal shop, right? Everybody basically got their basic needs met. It was cooperative. But where did the kibbutz sell those things? On the free market. So it was a cooperative work environment, that participated in the free market. Okay. Now, if I decided to create an institute, you know, work, I, we, 10 of us here, decided to get together, we all paid exactly the same, we produce something, for some reason that, that satisfies us, but we still have to put our goods on the free market in order for the income to come to us, that we can distribute it in a basic understanding of fairness, which is equally. Of course, the problem comes up with one person says, well, if I'm going to get paid my share no matter what I do, why should I work? Now, some people will work harder because part of their sense of self, part of their self-worth is to work hard. Not everybody has that, by the way. Some people says, my sense of self is not working hard. My work sense of self is to work the system. Now, that's, of course, the great downfall of any socialism is there are some folks whose identity is into working hard, other people's identity, I'm giving two extremes here, is to work the system. So that's actually the beginning of what we're going to call identity politics. It's not politics based in identifiable groups, but identity politics and resentment. This is a very important thing to understand. Identity politics means identities rooted in resentment, that there's an oppressor and something wrong has happened. And therefore, because of my identity and that my dignity has been damaged, I have to find the oppressor and try to right the wrong, which is almost not writable in any economic sense. It's just not writable, other than what I'm going to call the modern liberal democratic idea, which is representative government, independent judiciary, a regime of human rights, protections for the minorities, regulated free market, and let's all just go on and live with our lives. That is not going to repair a damaged identity, because you're going to have to do it yourself. There's nothing that the state can give you that's ultimately going to repair your identity if you're identified with resentment and the and looking enemy. How does that play into world history? I'm just going to mention a few things. If you, for example, look at one of the worst regimes in the history of planet Earth, certainly in the 20th century, was Imperial Japan. Imperial Japan was humiliated when the United States forced them to open their markets, and they were, they were militarily too weak to resist. American warships showed up, we, we wanted ports, we wanted places to refuel, we wanted to trade goods, and we said, if you don't open up your markets, we will bomb you. Now, you can look this up. You can imagine the way how damaging this was to Japanese identity, because part of Japanese identity is that they are the children of the sun. They are the chosen people. They are children of God. And then these vulgar, uncouth, racially different people come and humiliate them. So if you look at the history of Japan from the 1870s onward, it was an attempt to out-Western the Westerners. For example, they were greatly imitative of the British Navy. They sent people to 
to England. They mastered British style, British uniforms, the structure of the British military. They brought it back home. And there they were determined to build army and a navy like the British so they could imperialistically conquer the, the Southeast Asia and stand up to the Westerners. This is part of Japanese identity, which was the identity of shame, humiliation, resentment, master the imperialists, meaning ultimately the English, come back home and go to war. Whom did they go to war with first? Russia. If you look up the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905, there is a Japanese uh, so-called sneak attack on the Russian naval base in Vladivostok, and the whole world said, well, these hordes of inferior Asians have declared war on a Western power. That's going to go bad, except they won. Now, winning the Russo-Japanese War fueled, fueled the Japanese idea. We are a superior race. We've humiliated the Westerners, and we are now going on to conquering Southeast Asia. They first went into Korea, 1910, completely subjugated Korea, outlawed the language, outlawed the culture, and wanted to simply make it a colony of, uh, of Japan. They went into Manchuria in 1931 with the same idea. It's a Japanese colony, colony, then declared war on China in 1937 for only this purpose, which is we get to be imperialists. And we're going to take over everything in a way, part of the politics of resentment and shame. We were weak, now we're strong. How do you become strong? Become an empire. But then, as I've said many times, if you want to read a true story of colonialism and imperialism and murder and atrocity, run amok, read the history of the Sino-Japanese War, 1937 to 1905. You probably don't know anything about it. It's not taught in our schools. You certainly, when I say the idea of the millions who were massacred and tortured and had medical experiments uh, done upon them, put the Nazis to shame, the millions starved by famine, up to 20 million Chinese, if you don't read the book, you actually don't quite understand it because it was October 7th done over and over and over again by the Japanese to the Chinese. Another part of the Japanese was to get the Westerners, remember, uh, China itself had been humiliated by the West, the, the Western occupation of China. The part of the Japanese was take over China and get rid of the West. So, you know, sometimes when I quiz a high school kid, what was Pearl Harbor about? It was the Japanese needing to attack the British, the Dutch in Indonesia, the British in Singapore and Hong Kong, the Americans in the Philippines to get us out of Southeast Asia so it could become Japanese empire. Now, why am I saying all of this? It was rooted in the shame and resentment that happened in the middle of the 19th century. Deep hatred of the West, a deep hatred of the British and the Americans and all others who went into Asia and took it over, a, a truly arrogant imperialism and shaming either by product or by design, and I think some, some, some of it by design. I mean, a terribly arrogant racist attitude toward non-whites, which happened in China. And that's why you'll see Japan, the great exaltation when they killed white people. Now, I couldn't quite understand when I saw the massacres of Australians and the humiliation of American prisoners of war. It was racial payback. Now, I'm not making this up. You can go look it up. And I'm not saying there's anything bad with the Japanese, by the way. I mean, you look at the Japanese people after 1945, you couldn't pick people that are more committed to modern liberal ideas uh, that I, I talked about earlier. If you look at Germany, again, the humiliation after World War I, the Versailles Treaty, one of the greatest mistakes made in all of human history was the intense humiliation of the Germans. It doesn't license Nazism, but explains Nazism and the Nazi desire to find the enemy. Now, it could be the French, it could be the Americans, but they found a much more convenient enemy, a weak enemy within their borders, the Jew. The Jew is responsible. And remember, Nazism is entirely fueled by resentment, especially resentment against a mysterious enemy called the Jew. It has no relation to reality. I mean, I try to imagine when the Nazis come into the first Polish village that they conquered in 1939, they, they round up the Jews, and the Jews are saying, why? They will we're at war with you. And these simple Jews in some poor Polish village are saying, what do you mean we're at war with you? Look at you, look at us. What kind of war is this? It doesn't matter. We're at war with you. Now we will kill all of you. I mean, it's mystifying that German soldiers went into Poland and Ukraine and Soviet Union and murdered Jews because they were at war with the Jews and we never got the message. I mean, it's truly befuddling when you think about the German war on the Jews. It's, it's rooted in identity politics, meaning 
our German identity was shamed and damaged by Versailles, and we have to find out who the real enemy is, and the real enemy was an inner corruptive influence in Germany that led to our defeat, meaning the Jew. Now, there's no evidence for this whatsoever, but remember, identity politics are not rooted in evidence. They're rooted in shame. To go to our topic, the creation of the state of Israel, our heroic Zionist myth, you know, people without a land, a land without a people, look how good we are. Remember, that's one of our, I think, one of our most, it's not a destructive myth because we try to be good people. I mean, as a group, as a religion, as an ethnic group, as an identifiable group, we are dedicated to goodness. That's true. But it's gone to our heads that we think because we have such self-esteem and we have an inner sense of dignity because of our goodness that other people think we're good. We don't earn goodness in the eyes of other people by doing good. Feeds our myth of being good. With other people, it can create hatred and envy. Isn't that ironic? One of the things that we most deeply stand for is by being good to other people creates envy and hatred in response. Now, if you study the history of human resentment, I think I'll talk about Plato at the very end, then it's pre completely predictable. In our myth of goodness, and we go into Palestine, I mean, certainly we, we want to create a refuge for the Jewish people, but we think we're good. We're going to bring industry, and we're going to bring electricity and plumbing and a working state, and they should be grateful. They're not grateful because we've damaged their identity. Now, I don't have a solution to this, meaning I'm not going to say, oh, since we damaged their identity, go ahead and commit uh, genocide. I'm just trying to explain it. So for anybody who says, but we did so much good, it doesn't matter how much good you do to a person. If you damage their identity, they want to kill you. That's no, Not everybody, but there's a class of human beings. When you benefit them, they want to kill you. Why? Because you've pointed out their deficiency. Now, you can benefit in many ways. I mean, there are people who hate their psychologist and hate their doctor and hate their rabbi, you know, and hate anybody who's done them good because the good that you do points out to a certain class of human beings, I'm deficient, you have the power to heal, I don't feel healed, there's something wrong with you, therefore I need to kill you. I mean, it is a basic fact of social psychology, it plays out all the time everywhere. If you're not this kind of person, you don't understand it. You're completely befuddled. You don't understand how my being good creates rage in other people. You don't understand it, but you know that it's happened. It's happened to you or somebody, so, to somebody near you. So when we look at what's happening in Israel, um, uh, remember at the very beginning of the Zionist movement, and here's one reason why I, I recommend Noah Tishby's book, she points out there, there are actually many Arabs who saw the Jews as good. Hey, you're bringing industry, you're bringing economic growth, you're bringing electricity and plumbing and everything else. You can do a lot of good for us. We can have a great relationship. I mean, there were those who actually said that and thought that and wrote that. Welcome. We welcome the Jews. It's only going to be a mutual benefit. But there are others who said... It's ours. It's not yours. It doesn't matter how much good you do, and you're shaming us. Israeli victory in the War of 1948 is called Hanakba, the catastrophe. But as Noah Tishbe points out, that's not the original meaning of the word in uh, Muslim politics. The original meaning of the word Nakba was that we, this is speaking from an Arab perspective, that we allowed ourselves to be defeated by a nation of shopkeepers. It's not what they did to us, but it's what we did to ourselves. How could we not defend ourselves? How could our leaders bring us into an utterly destructive war? How could we have been so self-delusional that this war would be a cakewalk? So if you look at how the word Nakba is used, all the way through the 50s and the 60s, Nakba was used to self-inflicted shame. Self-inflicted shame. It's not the Jews' fault that they won the war. It's our fault that they won the war. How does, well, how does this shift? With the founding of the Palestine Liberation Organization, according to Noah Tishby, and I don't, don't see any, any error in this, that was, the Nakba was not what we did to ourselves, but it's what they did to us. Okay? It wasn't called Hanakba in the sense of what the Jews did, what we did to ourselves. Then it became what the Jews did. And if you look in the rhetoric of uh, modern Islamic politics, they look at the shape of the state of Israel, especially the 1949 armistice lines, it looks like a dagger. So here's the handle, here's the knife. The state of Israel is a dagger to the heart of the Arab Muslim world. I'm quoting. Now, we don't think that. We, meaning our Jews, have the myth of we're good people. We tried to do something good. Two-state solution. Sounds fair. 
From the other side is, it's a dagger to our heart. And therefore, two-state solution does not remove the dagger. The only thing that removes the dagger is the eradication of this people. Now, this is Hamas. Hamas is, it's a dagger to our heart. You've stolen from us, and you've shamed us. And that's why when you look on October 7th, GoPro cameras, they're all over the world. When they got back to Gaza with trucks of dead and mutilated bodies, the exaltation on the streets of Gaza, the singing, the cheering. You look at people who had out-of-body ecstatic experience. We've murdered Jews. I looked at it, and I thought to myself, first of all, I can't even imagine having this in America or in Israel, where Israel trucks back bodies of dead Palestinian civilians and rides them around Tel Aviv, and Israelis start to cheer. It's impossible to think. How do we explain it? Because Hamas was able to kill people who not only stole from them, but who shamed them. I don't want to, I want to take too much time today, but we can look at campus politics. We can look at American racial politics. We can look at some aspects of gender politics. There are many fair and just reasons, but there's a deep sense of, I've been robbed of my dignity. I've been robbed of my sense of self versus how you treat me and how you see me. And the only way to get this back is to shame you, to defeat you. This is a theme, again, it's not, it doesn't explain everything, but it explains a lot. And once we lock this idea in, there's no rational talking to someone who has been shamed. There's no rational talking to someone who has been indignified because they're propelled by something. I'll go now to my last one, Prelude's Republic. Socrates calls it the thymos. And Socrates says there's three parts of what he calls the inner life. There are many more, but here's are three. One is reason. I want to understand the world and achieve my life goals through reasoning well. We would call this the, the reasonable actor in the world, which is mo modern political theory is based on the idea that we reasonably set ourselves to achieve our life goals. Life goals are set by passions. Okay? So whatever your passion is, you use reason to get your life goals. And this was, this was already in the Republic by Plato. Why? Because you figure out what's the best way to rule the city. Well, the city is composed by individuals, so what are individuals like? So to rule the city, you have to have a theory of the soul. So you say, yeah, we're ruled by passions, meaning what I want, reason, how to get it, but also thymos, which is the search for dignity, esteem, regard of others, and then dysthymia, which is I've been indignified, I've not been regarded, I haven't felt esteem, and it really doesn't matter what you do. It matters how you make me feel. So you could say, yeah, I didn't do anything. You might have not done anything. But just by being you, you have created in them a sense of self-deficiency, which leads to a war within, a war within. It's not reason. It's not desire. It's something else. So if I'm not mistaken, in book four of Plato's Republic, this is brought up that if you want to govern the city, don't think you have a bunch of reasonable people trying to to realize their self-interest, that's reason and passion, there's a whole other thing going on in every human being, and this can destroy the city. It can destroy people, it can destroy relationships, and I'm gonna go further and say, it can actually destroy Western civilization. And I'm not, I'm not kidding. Japan was propelled by dysthymia, if I can use a psychoanalytic term. Germany is propelled by dysthymia. ISIS was propelled by dysthymia, in addition to other things. Hamas is propelled by dysthymia. About a lot of American politics are propelled by dysthymia, including other things, including actual objective injustices, but fueled by the sense of, I've been indignified, therefore I want to destroy, maybe just theoretically, maybe by reverse exclusion, but it's a war. What does it mean for all of us? I wanted to give this talk to you. I know it sounds highly theoretical and maybe too psychoanalytic and trying to explain too much by a small thing. It, it, it may be all of that but I want us to understand what we're up against. I think, I think Western civilization is at stake if we don't address this, because we can break ourselves down into competing groups of dysthymia who will destroy everything. It's like a culture of, of metaphoric suicide bombers. I'll take the whole thing down if I don't feel better about myself. And by the way, that explains a suicide bomber. I mean, suicide bomber says, I feel so horrible about myself what's happened to my people. I would rather die hurting you than actually live. Freud had to accept that the drive to life is actually not one of the, is not 
the singular greatest human motivator. Freud called it thanatos, the drive to death. He misunderstood it. It wasn't the drive to death. It that death is preferable to indignity. Death is better than being disregarded. So as we try to figure this out, I don't have a solution for today. This was actually much more educational. I'm appealing to our intellectual, spiritual sophistication about ourselves. If you see yourself in here, I really want you to look at yourself. Because if you see the, this dysthymia, that I am angry and shamed and depressed because of other regard, you have to work that through because it's going to make you sick the rest of your life, and you're probably going to hurt other people. If this is your thing, please get to work on it. And as you can imagine, I'll be addressing this in my, my future Wisdom Works classes. So that's for all of us. If you want to understand what's driving other people, know this for sure. Some people are driven by dysthymia, which means injured self. Want to understand what's happening in the Middle East? A lot of it is dysthymia. What's happening in the rest of the world? They are like, excuse my expansive use of this archetypal idea, it's Isaac over-identifying with Esau that says, I can't tell Esau the truth because he'll feel bad about himself. So this is enabling others by helping them avoid dysthymia so they never have to work on themselves. It's an archetype for me. I don't want to overstate it, but I want you to think to yourself what it means that, we be, that in many places we become a culture of protecting other people from facing the fact that they haven't excelled and they, and they can excel. This is God talking to Cain. You can do better. You don't have to go kill Abel. You don't have to hate me, God. You can just get that work and do better. This is what happens in Genesis. Cain says, actually, thanks for the advice, Pop, but I'm going to go kill Abel. Right? There's more truth to that story than you can possibly imagine. I'll think about more what we need to do about this, but the politics, identity politics, which means a society devoted to overcoming the injuries, injured identities, it's a good thing. We should, as much as we can, help people overcome their injured identities, but they have to want it as well. And the only thing that I can think move us from the inner, ultimate inner state of resentment and envy is inner work. I'm not saying there's not an outer dimension of political repair to me. There absolutely is. But the stained identity of dysthymia, of resentment and envy, it, it is a spiritual task. It can only be accomplished spiritually from within, and then hopefully that redounds to a, a struggle, the political struggle, to create fairness. But I think it has to begin, begin or coincide with a struggle for inner well-being.